Hey guys, welcome to Book Review 138. Today I will be reviewing Putin Country, A Journey into the Real Russia by Anne uh, Garls, PBS correspondent. Um, well, anyway, kind of the premise of this book is that uh, Anne Garls travels to uh, Chelsnabrink not once, but many times over the, the course of the uh, post-Soviet Union breakdown. Uh, into eventual, eventually all the ex-states, specifically Russia, the state that Chelsnabrink is in, um, and kind of sees how everyday Russians are living. Uh, this isn't uh, Moscow's Russia. Um, this isn't the power broker Russia of the Kremlin, although the effects of uh, the choices made in the Kremlin um, affect people's uh, everyday lives. This is the uh, Russia of the drug addicts, the Russia of the doctor who um, has almost no diagnostic or medical equipment um, and actually has to barter, um, this is specifically in the 90s, has to barter um, uh, different types of uh, resources in order to get medical equipment, most of them having nothing to do with the medical care industry. I think, you know, cement, things like that, trading them for IV needles. Um, now, it was mentioned uh, specifically with the doctors that later on that they were able to establish um, uh, uh, some more uh, security, some more stability. Um, but the effect of this, was that, and it's not only in the healthcare profession, um, but really across the board, was that there is more stability in Russia now under Putin, um, but freedoms are just being cut willy-nilly left and right. Um, and a lot of people kind of on the outside looking in don't necessarily have the uh, resources to uh, help themselves if they get in a bad spot. Uh, not that they ever really did, but that it's um, specifically when it comes to like rights uh, or sort of the marginalized groups of society, um, they're really sort of left out more in the cold uh, than they would, at least the hope was that they would um, in the post-Soviet Union era. And that's really what she talks about uh, more than anything. She talks about, you know, uh, the Muslim community and how they've essentially been uh, demonized how um, there is the official Muslim church, which uh, is more than just a rubber stamp, provides um, spiritual guidance to its uh, believers. But when it comes to any sort of um, political angle that they might have, they always have to go with uh, the Kremlin. Um, and sort of the way that it's, you know, uh, counteracted is that anybody that is a Muslim that doesn't go with the Kremlin is just automatically carte blanche, um, assumed to be a terrorist or, you know, working for some sort of fundamentalist organization, which in a lot of times, you know, Russia being relatively close to the Middle East, being relatively close in uh, part of the ex-Soviet Union, uh, close to Central Asia, um, has a fairly sizable Muslim community, as does Chelsnabrink. Um, and how they deal with this is, uh, you know, a matter of, of controversy. Um, the same could be said also about uh, the Russian Orthodox Church. You know, the Russian Orthodox Church had a big revival uh, post-Soviet Union, the, post the communists, largely professing atheism, even though small amounts were allowed uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, but the uh, Kremlin has essentially used powers within the Orthodox Church in order to advance their agenda. Now, that doesn't mean that everything within the Orthodox Church uh, is, is terrible, but when it comes to the Kremlin, uh, there's only one choice. Um, Let's see, what else do they talk about? Oh, they talked about human rights activists. Um, 
forget what the the name uh, of the specific organization was. I want to say it was like Heritage or something like that. Uh, but it was a very poetic uh, name for essentially what would be like the equivalent of like an ACLU uh, in the United States and how um, post uh, Soviet Union, there were a lot of heady days in terms of the rights of individuals, in terms of really opening up. Um, but again, uh, things got so wild economically, and I think people were somewhat confused about uh, rights versus economic stability, um, that they were willing to trade in under Putin uh, a lot of the, the rights they had in order to uh, have stability. Uh, and a classic example of this is uh, in the human rights organizational community within Russia. Um, it used to be that it was partially funded by non-governmental organizations within Russia, um, but a large source of funding came from non-governmental sources outside of Russia, who were largely um, were not acting nefariously, were uh, trying to advance civil rights within, within Russia. Um, but because of sort of the xenophobia of the Putin years, um, it's not that all funds have been cut off, but uh, organizations can essentially be uh, kind of behind the curtains, blacklisted uh, if they take too many funds from outside organizations. So it's not the all right, uh, all right, it's not the uh, outright totalitarian ban of the Soviet uh, era, but it's just continuing to make things more and more difficult for, you know, outside groups. Same applies for adoption agencies. Um, it used to be that uh, uh, people from the West could fairly easily, uh, post-Soviet Union, of course, I'm talking about like in the, like in the 90s, uh, adopt Russian babies, specifically from orphanages. There's a huge um, uh, orphan problem within Russia, you know, uh, Russian men die very early uh, because of abuse of drug and alcohol problems. Um, the mothers are more consistent, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee things. And uh, just, it's almost like a tidal wave that um, the social services uh, industries within Russia cannot deal with. And for a while they dealt with that by allowing uh, overseas parents to adopt. Um, but that has largely gone by the wayside. Uh, something else about that is that uh, even in Russia, um, adoptions are largely seen through healthy babies or people that want to adopt only want to adopt healthy babies, uh, babies that don't have any sort of you know, autism or Down syndrome or even less severe um, medical ailments. Uh, and so if you're a foster kid and you have one of those ailments, the chances of you getting adopted are almost zero. Uh, Anna Garland uh, Garls does mention a couple counterexamples, but I think that these counterexamples are uh, extraordinary in the fact of how compassionate these people were in um, how they kind of went against society norm of, well, if somebody uh, isn't the ideal or the standard for what you want for a child, uh, then they're just not worth it, you know? And it should just, it's not, it's not my problem. It's, it's too much of a hassle anyway. Um, let's see. Forensics experts, uh, freedom of speech. I'm just kind of reading some of the, the subtitles now. Uh, they talk about a taxi driver that um, kind of used to be a I think a psychology professor or something was like some sort of uh, fairly high level um, ranking professional. Um, but again, the theme of the 1990s was that everything collapsed. Like it was really sort of uh, a mad scramble. Um, and it's not necessarily that things were better under the Soviets, but they were just, I mean, things were pretty terrible under the Soviets, but they were just kind of more consistent. And if Putin hasn't brought back the actual communism of the Soviets, he's traded in some of the wildness of early democracy for um, security. But the question is, is are, are they ultimately going to move to 
uh, a more open and free society. Um, talk about the gay life, uh, which is kind of interesting in that uh, gay people are very much stigmatized within Russia. Uh, again, um, well, yeah. Well, I was going to mention uh, gay couples can't adopt, let alone really marry or, you know, um, they can kind of come out, uh, you know, it's not illegal, but there's certainly a stigmatism that goes along with it, which is uh, quite sad. Um, yeah, and the last kind of little bit kind of talks about um, some of the uh, economic or the environmental problems that Russia has around, specifically around Chelsnabrink. Um, most people know Chernobyl in terms of nuclear disasters, and that was like uh, a singular site uh, nuclear problem. Um, but Chelsnabrink really kind of had an additional um, nuclear meltdown problem that the Soviets kept much more secret. Uh, but in addition to that, they also had uh, a, uh, and something about Chelsnabrink, I should have mentioned this from the top, was that under the Soviets, everything was secret about the city. There was no access unless you were in the military or had special permission to go to the city. Um, so there was a lot of like nuclear sites around the area, nuclear testing, uh, not necessarily all nuclear bombs, but just sort of like, uh, uh, you know, reactors or um, a lot of like dumping went on, like nuclear dumping went on in the area uh, that was uncontained. Um, and specifically they mentioned like a village where uh, the people essentially started getting sick and they didn't know why and it was because their government was dumping nuclear waste uh, in in their river, the river that they use. You know, these are just like uh, basic farmer villager people. Uh, you know, I hate to say like feudal, but almost like you know non modern. Um, that were getting sick and they didn't know why, and it was because the government was again dumping nuclear uh, material in their river without them knowing, which is uh, pretty sad. Uh, the last two chapters, changing landscapes. Uh, yeah, that kind of talks about how a lot of the collective farms have broken down, and um, uh, it talks about how the China, oddly enough, the Chinese have come in and set up these like temporary farms uh, that farm in the summertime and raise vegetables and then ship them back to China to sell. Uh, and in general, the chapter kind of mentions just how. Uh, uh, just a visual look at the countryside seems like a country that's broken or has largely been given up. You know, there's huge abandoned areas, there's huge areas where, you know, um, uh, you know broken fences, rusting tractors, uh, just everything just seems kind of dilapidated. That's a good way to put it. Um, last chapter, Red Lines. Uh, let's see. And it just kind of talks and concludes about uh, Chels in the Brink and um, how there is some hope for the future, but just there's a lot of a lot of uh, negative stuff that goes on, um, you know, with the NGOs and all that kind of stuff. So I'm sure I didn't uh, do as good a job as I could have at reviewing this. Um, and the book does not really have like a singular theme that goes throughout it. If I were to have a criticism, that would be it. That like uh, each chapter is kind of dedicated to a different person and they're not really interwoven at all. They're just kind of, they're all similar in the sense that they're Chelsea Brink citizens and all kind of suffer under a larger uh, Soviet authority. Um, but none of the stories are really interlinked. So. You have the story about the gay people, the story about the doctor, the story about the uh, uh, you know, nuclear meltdown uh, that are very kind of separated. So that would be my criticism. But if you want a portrait, a collage of what life in a post-Soviet city that isn't the uh, uh, glam and money and uh, high-strung life of Moscow, that really what the real Russians are, check out... Putin Country, A Journey into the Real Russia by Anne Garlands. All right, see you guys later. Bye.